Well, good evening, everybody. March 13th, 2020. I think we all remember where we were that day. It's become known as the day that the world shut down. Anybody else remember where you were on March 13th, 2020? That's when we began to hear the news that schools were beginning to close, businesses were beginning to close, churches were even beginning to close. And I remember where I was, I was at work at the church and like everybody else, we had to figure out a new plan really quickly too. Sunday was coming. And so I knew that I needed to get a few things before I headed home because none of us knew how long the lockdown was gonna last. But I said, let me finish these things. And once I'm done with at the church, I'll head home. So we finished probably eight, nine o'clock. And so I headed home and I decided to stop at Costco with everybody else in the world. And we get there and I get a few things. And then I get to the aisle of the toilet paper and they're completely sold out. I said, this is going to be a problem. So I asked the guy, I'm like, hey man, you guys like have some in the back? You want to brown them a little late, but can you bring it out? And he goes, he just laughed at me. He's like, we sold out of that hours ago. So I'm going, oh no, what am I going to do? And so how many of you know that I probably needed toilet paper and some other things a long time before that, but I waited until the last minute. How many of you know you can't find toilet paper in a crisis? And I believe that it's the same thing for relationships in your life. It's the same thing for the community that we need. You can't build community in a crisis. You can't build community in a crisis. And so tonight, that's what I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about the importance of those relationships, the importance of building community before we actually need it. And don't worry, I went over to my mom's house. She had plenty of toilet paper, so I got everything that I needed, and I was good to go. So let's pray first. God, we thank you for an opportunity tonight to, to just learn from your word. God, I pray that each and every single one of us, that you would open up our eyes, that you would open up our ears to see the scriptures maybe differently than we've seen them before, maybe verses that we've read hundreds of times before. Tonight, would you give us a new, a fresh way to look at things? And would you give us the courage and the boldness to step out and to be obedient and to build that community before the crisis comes? We love you. We give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, if you have a Bible, you can pull it out and you can turn to Acts chapter two, or if you're watching this online and maybe you're driving, don't worry, we're gonna put everything on the screen for you. So we're gonna start in Acts chapter two, verse 46. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And so you see, I think this verse, this is really the Acts chapter two, if you, if you remember, that's really the birth of the early church. That's the New Testament church. That's the day of Pentecost. That's when really the church began. You're sitting here. That was the first church. And so I think this Acts chapter 246 verse gives us something very important. It talks about they were meeting in temple courts. So temple courts, that's a large gathering. Then it says that they broke bread in their homes. So the temple courts, the temple courts, that's the large gathering. That's what we do every Sunday, every Tuesday, right? So in fact, in the early church, only the priests were allowed to go into the temple. So the people actually gathered in the courts. They gathered right outside of the church. That would be like us saying, hey, we're gonna have church, but you guys just hang out on 51st Street and we're gonna, we're gonna kind of do it that way. But really, I think that's so important because maybe if you're watching this online, that's really the biblical example for what you're doing. It's a, still a big, large gathering corporate worship experience, but you're able to still experience that whether you're online or right here in the building. And so the second part of that verse, the Acts 2.46, it says, they broke bread in their homes. They broke bread in their homes. So homes, if temple courts is the large gathering, then homes, that's the small gathering. And here at TSC, we call those connect groups. So you have temple courts, that's large gathering, that's Sundays and Tuesdays. We come in here, we worship, and Elder Vicky's leading us, or Freddie's leading us, Pastor Tim's preaching. That's the big, large gathering. Then we also, we, we also do that second part of that. We gather in homes through connect groups. And so really the Sunday, Tuesday, that's the celebration. That's the big services. That's the gathering. And then those connect groups, that's the fellowship. And I'm going to talk some more about that fellowship in a minute. 
And then read the, I wanna read this Hebrews verse, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. The writer of Hebrews says, and let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not abandoning our own meeting together as in the habit of some people, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so many times we, we think that verse means don't abandon meeting together. That means everybody come to church, come to church. But that's really not necessarily the only meaning of that. Because if you remember, the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of Christians that they're kind of going through it in a little bit. They're suffering. Maybe they're being persecuted. They're just struggling with life. And the writer of Hebrews says, hey, keep getting together so you can encourage one another. And I'm going to talk some more about that encouragement in a minute, because at the end of the day, we we all need to be needed and we all need to be known. We need to be needed and we need to be known. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.19, you are members of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Apostle Paul also tells us in Romans 12.5, so in Christ, we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. See, there's an important word in both of those verses. What is it? Belong, belong. We all belong to each other. We belong to God, but we belong to each other. We can never experience Christ fully by ourselves. We need other people. We're all a part of that body of Christ, right? And so it's like your leg can't say to your arm, well, no, I don't belong to you. No, it's all part of one body. We're all part of one body of Christ and we need each other. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said it like this. Some Christians try to go to heaven alone in solitude, but believers are not compared to bears or lions or other animals that wander alone. But those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect, that they love to get together. Sheep go in flocks and so do God's people. So do God's people because God made us for relationships. God made us for relationships. And your closest relationships should be, in, it should be intentional, not accidental. Your closest relationships should be intentional, not accidental. So you may be asking, well, Sally, here we are. We're a large church. There's thousands of people every, coming in here every week. How do we do that? How does a large church like this maintain fellowship and friendship? Very simple, connect groups. That's how we do that. We do that through connect groups. Remember, temple courts, that's the large gathering. That's the worship. Every Sunday, Tuesday, we're coming in here. And then the home to home, the house to house, that's the connect groups. And listen, you cannot wait until the crisis comes to do this. These connect groups are critical. They're, import, they're so important to our walk with God right? Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, two are better off than one. If one of them falls down, the other can help him up. Let me help you. We will fall down. <laughs> we will fall down. So when two are better off than one, if one of us falls down, the other person can help us up. Because Sundays and Tuesdays, those are our catalysts. Those are our catalysts. Like when you come in here, it should crank up your desire. When after Pastor Tim's preaching and he's running around and he's yelling, he's getting you fired, we should be fired up when we walk out of here. That's a catalyst for the rest of our week. The large gathering should increase your desire for life change, but it can't change your life. It should increase your desire, but it can't change your life. Because life change happens in the context of relationships. Your life is not shaped by information. Your life is shaped by relationships. I can prove that to you. Who was the very first connect group? It was Jesus and his 12 disciples. Remember, after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, what did he do? He went, he, went into, he went into the wilderness for 40 days. The devil is chasing after him and he's going, he's praying, he's saying, flee from me, devil. He's quoting scripture. He's doing all this stuff. He walks out of the wilderness. He's filled up. He did his prayer and fasting. He's ready to go. And the first thing that he does, there's people all around. He could do whatever he wanted. He could start a YouTube channel. He could travel the world. He could do whatever he wanted. What does he do? He goes and gathers, he walks on the Sea of Galilee and he, gra he gathers a few people to come and walk with him. That's the very first connect group. In fact, that happened in Matthew four. Well, in Matthew chapter 28, the very last thing that Je Jesus tells us is what? The Great Commission, right? We're gonna read it, Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you say, what does it mean to make disciples? The most simple, clearest explanation I've ever heard of discipleship. My old pastor used to say, discipleship is simply showing someone what God has shown you. It's simply showing someone what God has shown you. Discipleship is relational. And discipleship happens in connect groups. That's why we want you in the connect groups. Okay, so Matthew chapter four, Jesus came out of the wilderness. He's like ready to go. He's gathering his people. He's gathering his disciples, right? He says, come on, Simon Peter, come with me. Andrew, John, James, everybody come with me. So from that moment in in Matthew chapter four, when Jesus begins gathering his disciples until the moment of Jesus's death, there's 63 total events, okay? 63 total events, 46 of these events happened with his disciples. That means that happened in a small gathering. 46 of those events happened at a connect group, basically. Only 17 of those events in Jesus's life happened in the Lord's gathering. Those are the big sermons that he preached. Those are the big miracles that he did when he had the masses. That means that 73% of Jesus's ministry was discipleship. That means it happened with a small group of believers. We would call that a connect group. So he spent 73% of his time with the 12. My old pastor used to say it like this, what Jesus modeled, Jesus meant. So if Jesus modeled that for us, how many of you know that Jesus meant for us to follow that? So why did Jesus, why did he leave the crowd? Jesus came out of the wilderness. He could do anything. Why did he leave the crowd and gather with the small? Because I believe that Jesus knew that life change happens by wrestling with the truth in a small group of people. Because limited life change can happen while you're sitting in these rows, right? You're just listening to a sermon. Pastor Tim said this a couple of weeks ago, and it stuck with me. As Satan unleashes his worst people, God unleashes his best people. And I believe that God's best people are right here. They're me and you. God wants to use us just like he wanted to use those disciples. And maybe you're watching this. Maybe you're on a plane and you're headed off to do business. Maybe you're on a train to New Jersey. Wherever you're watching this, you're one of God's best that God wants to use to build his church. And that's what we do through connect groups. And maybe you're here tonight or you're watching this and you go, well, I'm not qualified to start a connect group. I don't know how to teach. Listen, that's actually a good thing because if you know how to teach, you're probably gonna talk too much while you lead your group. <laughs> Nobody wants to be in a connect group with somebody's talking, right? So, so, so that's why we believe because we're not asking you to preach. All we're asking you to do is to follow the example that Jesus did. Jesus said, come here, you 12. We're gonna start a little small group. I'm gonna ex- explain some things to you because you get information from sermons and teaching, but you get transformation from community. We're looking for transformation, not information, okay? Now listen, so many times we, hear, we get this question all the time about connect groups. Well, I don't know how to start it. It seems so complicated. It seems so hard. So tonight I am gonna make it so easy for you. I asked our team to put together just a little video, like a little quick, I'm gonna show you how, if you have your phone right now, you can even pull out your phone if you want to. It's okay if you're in church, if you're watching this, if you're driving, don't pull your phone out. But if you're sitting at a laptop, I want you to go to tsc.ny. I see in our team. Let's go ahead and put that video up, okay? Look, look how easy. You click on next steps, connect groups. You scroll down. You can see we have all kinds of things for you to pick a group from. You literally click that little red button right there in the middle of the screen. It says lead a group. And then you just give us a little bit of information. And then at the bottom, you're gonna hit, I think it says submit. You're gonna hit submit. That's it. That's literally all you have to do to start a group. That's literally all you have to do. You don't have to be qualified. You don't have to know the whole Bible. You just have to be willing. You have to be one of those people, as Pastor Tim said, that God is ready to release his best people. As Satan is unleashing his worst, God is releasing his best. You guys, us, we are the best people that God wants to use in this time. I love... 
I love, I didn't know Pastor Patrick was gonna pray for young people tonight, but I love it because I started thinking about it. Um, there's, I love what we're doing in our 212 ministry. Grant and Emily and Stan and Natasha are leading that for our next generation, high school, college, junior high. And Grant, you guys know Grant, he leads worship here. He's the tall guy, he normally stands over here. Grant has a, for his connect group, do you know what he does? He goes to one of the high schools and he just plays basketball with the high school boys. And then he invites them to come to their 212 services every Friday night. So what Grant is doing when he plays basketball, that's the house to house. That's the small gathering like Jesus did, right? And then Grant is saying, oh, also we have the large gathering on Friday nights. Come for 212. Maybe maybe you want to start a group. Uh, We have people who, we have a group of people, they do a photography connect group. They literally just walk around New York City with their cameras and they take pictures of stuff. That's the house to house gathering. Um, And it doesn't matter. You can do online or you can do in person. I know Elder Jerry, he led a connect group last semester and it was on basically world history. They had men from all over the world that would get on a Zoom call, some people from different time zones, there was young guys, there was old guys, a whole group of people that would just get together and talk about history of the world. Um, I had a group of people, we, we played tennis every Friday morning at Central Park. You can literally do a group on anything. There's a, there's a, there's a woman that I talked to a few weeks ago. She has a, a group of ladies and they gather on Zoom every Thursday morning at six in the morning. You don't have to get in that early group, but that, that's what they do. And they, they read through the 260 journey together for one hour. That's, that's all that they do because listen, it doesn't matter what you do. The groups are more about who you're doing it with, not what you're doing. It's who you're doing it with. It's those relationships you're building. It's that community you're building before the crisis comes, right? And we want to help you. We want to come alongside of you. If you saw on that website or if you have a minute, go back and look and you're saying, well, I don't even know what I would teach. Don't worry about it. We already made videos for you. You can literally go on the website and all you have to do to start your connect group, you hit play and you play the videos that we made for you. And then when the videos are done, we even have questions. You can literally read the questions from the website and discuss them. Because remember, it's not about what you're doing. It's about who you're doing it with. That's our plan for make, how are we gonna follow the Great Commission? Through connect groups. Our plan for making disciples of Jesus Christ is connect groups. We are not a church with connect groups. We're a church of connect groups, right? Three years before the greatest crisis in Jesus's life, and really the greatest crisis in the history of mankind, Jesus began calling his disciples and asking him to join his community. Before Jesus went to the cross, he had already built his community, right? You can't build community in crisis. That's why we don't want you to wait. You can't build community in crisis. We don't want you to wait until your children begin to doubt their faith, or maybe someone in your family is going through cancer. We don't want you to be try to hurry up and scramble to find community when maybe you lose your job. Whatever the crisis is, don't be like me. I couldn't get my toilet paper. Don't be like me and wait to build your community. A few years ago, um, I was in a connect group with about seven or eight different women, and we would get together every Wednesday night, and our whole connect group was based around dinner. Each one of us would take a turn cooking dinner, and then we would talk about life. We'd talk about what was going on in our work, in our jobs, our families. And then one night, um, one of the women in our connect group, her name was Ingrid, and she comes to the group, and she told us that uh, she had just been diagnosed with cancer. And um, she was from another country. She didn't really speak English that well. She didn't understand how the chemo worked. She didn't understand what the doctors were saying. And in our connect group, there was a woman who was also a hospice nurse. So she had been always working with these doctors. She'd been working with the hospital. So the woman in my connect group, her name was Lacey. She was able to walk alongside Ingrid. She got to go to every doctor's appointment with her. She got to handle every insurance call with her. She got the deal just when the doctors would say things and Ingrid, didn't the, the language bearer, she didn't understand. Lacey was there to interpret her. Ingrid didn't wait until the crisis. Ingrid didn't wait until the crisis to build community. Because, listen, connect groups are not a ministry of the church. They're not a program of the church. They're not an outreach of the church. Connect groups are the church. The church is me and you. The church is made up of the people. Remember, we are the body of Christ. We belong to each other. We belong to each other. 
A few weeks ago, um, Pastor Patrick mentioned every Wednesday night is our worldwide prayer meeting from the Summit Campus, and Pastor Carter Conlin, our general overseer, he leads that. And he said something a few weeks ago that I've, I've been thinking about a lot. He was talking about that God is raising up an end-time army. And this is what he said. He said, if you're hearing him call you, God will prosper you and equip you. You don't have to understand everything. We just have to obey God and whatever he asks you to do, do it. Whatever he asks you to do, do it. For some of you that are here tonight, God is asking you to start a connect group. He is asking you to build community before that crisis comes. He is asking you to follow the example of Jesus and begin to put people around you who can help walk with you in the toughest times, the toughest moments of your life. And Pastor Carter is exactly right. God will equip you. God will empower you. We're not good enough to do it. Newsflash, we are not good enough but God will equip us to do it. So uh, Pastor Tim mentioned this on Sunday, but we've begun something called Next Steps, and it happens every Thursday night on the second floor, and we're just talking through just your next step in your walk with God, and it's been incredible to just meet so many of you and to hear some just incredible stories of what God is doing in your life and even just what God is calling you to do right now in this season. And a few weeks ago, I met this precious woman. She was an older woman. She's been coming to the church for a while. And she just, after the class was done, she, she said, Sally, I, I love coming to this. I just, I just have a question. And I go, okay, what's your question? And she says, why does this church talk about connect groups so much? And I just busted out laughing. And I helped her. I asked her, I said, okay, this is why we do it. And I kind of explained a little bit about what we're doing. And really, that's kind of why I wanted to share this tonight. And so this is what I want to do right now. I want to give you four reasons we talk about connect groups so much at this church. <laughs> so the first one, connect groups are biblical. Connect groups are biblical. And remember what we talked about at the beginning of this. Acts chapter two, that's the birth of the church. That's when it all started. So if that's the day of Pentecost. 3,000 believers get there. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're just going, man, this is crazy. What do we do? What do we do? And Peter was preaching there that day. And you may, I'm about to share this verse with you. And you may remember this, but on January 9th, when Pastor Tim shared the vision message, and it was called Move the Needle. And he gave the vision for us to reach 1 billion people. And these connect groups are a part of that. These connect groups are a part of that. And so what the verse that Pastor Tim shared that day, Acts 2.38, the people, the believers, that's the first church, and they're going, what do we do, Peter? What do we do? All this amazing stuff, Holy Spirit is there. Is, what do we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so right after that, that's the repent, that's the born again part. Pastor Tim talked about that. We do that every week. Repent, be baptized in water, filled with the Holy Spirit. Repent, baptized in water, filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, four verses after that, immediately after, okay, so we got born again, we did all that. So what do we do next? Four verses after that, Acts chapter two, verse 42, this is what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That was a connect group. <laughs> That's a connect group. As soon as they were born again, as soon as they repented, as soon as they were water baptized, filled with the Spirit, their next step immediately was to form around a community of believers. And there's so many things in there. We like to say there's four things you, we do in 242. So every connect group has four things. It has four things that we're doing. You can put that verse back up there. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's whatever you do for your connect group. Maybe you wanna do the Freedom Connect group. Maybe you wanna do the 260 Journey Connect group. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, that's what you're doing. And then the fellowship, that's the relationship part that we need. That's the transformation part where our lives can be changed. Then the, the, the breaking of the bread, that's the food part. You don't have to have food at your connect group, but I'm just telling you from experience, it's a whole lot better when you do. And maybe you're here on Zoom and you're going, well, we're not, we're not physically together. I've seen groups do this before where they just say, hey, everybody, when you log into your Zoom call, bring a snack and we're just gonna eat a snack. What are you eating? No, I'm eating this. What are you eating? What are you? And then people, there's a little envy. Sometimes people are eating better food. You just work on that later. But that's really, that, that's all it is. You, and if you want to, you can, it, it doesn't matter. Maybe, maybe you're saying, I live in New York City, my apartment. If you're like me, your apartment's very small. I probably, I can't have a connect group 
group over at my apartment, but you can go to Starbucks. You can go meet in the park. Maybe you're watching this from France or from the UK. Wherever you live, you can gather with people in any location. It doesn't have to be home to home. It could be, it, it, I've seen groups meet right outside of Central Park. I've seen groups meet at the basketball court. I've seen groups meet at the tennis court, at the gym. I've seen groups meet. We have a group of parents who every Friday night, when they bring their kids, when they bring their high school students and their college, well, the parents don't bring the college students, college students drive, but the parents who bring their high school students, they meet together and have a connect group and just pray while 212 is happening. And so you can do that wherever you are. And then to prayer, who doesn't want to be prayed for? Who doesn't need some more prayers in your life? Um, uh, a few years ago, a friend of mine and I, we led a connect group and it was literally a brunch connect group. It was literally, we called it bacon and eggs. And I would just cook a bunch of food and we just have people over at our house. We'd hang out. And then at the end of the group, we'd all just kind of sit together and we'd say, hey, is there anything that anybody needs prayer for? And then we would just pray for each other. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. That's really all that a connect group is. I love the way that Eugene Peterson, the writer of the message version, this is what he says. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal and prayers. That's it. That's it. The life together. That's what we're doing. We want you to do life with other people. We want you to build your community before that crisis comes. We want you to be like Ingrid and put people in your life to help you. Maybe, maybe we prayed for the young people tonight. Maybe, maybe you're one of the people, young, your young person is, is struggling. Get around a group of community of believers that can not only pray for you, but maybe can help you. Maybe they have experience or they know something to help you with. And then uh, the writer of Hebrews, I want to go back to that for the writer of Hebrews in 3.13 says this, but encourage one another daily, encourage one another daily. That's what you can do in a group. We're, we're not going to gather together every day on Sundays and Tuesdays, but if you're in a group of people, in a community of people, you can text each other. Hey, hey, I'm praying for you. I know this was a rough week. I'm praying for you. I'm thinking of you. Hey, I know you have that big meeting at work today. I'm praying for you. Hey, you're doing an awesome job, mom. You're doing an awesome job, dad. We all need encouragement because we all need to be needed and we all need to be known. So the first reason why we do connect groups here is because they're biblical. Number two, the second reason, connect groups are a cure for loneliness. How many of you know that we have an epidemic of loneliness in our country? An epidemic of loneliness in our country. I read a CDC report the other day that said that loneliness is worse for your health and will cause you to die earlier than smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being obese. Another CDC report said that there are more depression and anxiety drugs being prescribed today than any other time in human history. What the world needs more than anything else in our society today is the antidote to loneliness. Where are they gonna get that? The church. I can't think of a better place, the antidote to loneliness, the church. I read something the other day, the World Health Organization, WHO, which through the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we all kind of learned a lot from them. We were following them. We we're following their recommendations. Well, the World, Heart, World Health Organization got together with a group of psychologists and sociologists, and they started something called social prescribing. Social prescribing, they decided, is it, 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 they said that this can help with your loneliness. They said it's better than meds. Do you know what it is? They prescribe people to just hang out with other people. And there's all these articles, like they cracked the code, they figured it out, wrong. God figured that out 3,000 years ago, right? In the garden, what happened? Genesis 2.18, it is not good for man to be alone. So many times we look at that just as a marriage verse, but really, but really, that was God saying, you can't do this on your own, Adam. I'm gonna bring Eve. Then he slowly began to build a community of people because sin was not the first problem in the Bible. Sin came in in Genesis 3. That was not the first problem. Isolation and loneliness was the first problem in Genesis 2. So Adam is in the garden, he is in paradise and God said, it is not good for you to be alone. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I look around, I don't think I'm in paradise. So if Adam needed, if Adam was in paradise and he needed other people, don't you think that here we are in our world in 2022, we need other people and we can't wait until the crisis comes. I love the way that Eugene Peterson says, he said, God never works with individuals in isolation, but always with people in community, 
always with people in community. That's why we want you in a group. That's why we want you to start a connect group. So why do we talk about connect groups so much at this church? Number one, it's biblical. Number two, it's a cure for loneliness. And number three, connect groups are multipliers. Connect groups are multipliers. A few weeks ago at our Next Steps class, this this precious woman came up to me. Her name is Venus. And she said, Sally, I wanna tell you about my connect group. And I said, okay, cool, what are you guys doing? And she said, the name of my connect group is Together We Make a Difference. Together We Make a Difference. Tell me that's not a great name for a connect group, right? Together We Make a Difference. And she said, every single Saturday, they go out in the community to different areas and they set up a table and she just has a few people with her and they just simply pray for people. Hey, can we pray for you? Hey, can we pray for you? And I said, wow, that's amazing, that's so cool. The next Sunday morning, that was Thursday night, Sunday morning, I'm getting ready for church and I got an email and Venus sends me an email and to tell me about her connect group from the day before. And she said, Sally, it was incredible. She said that between 70 and 80 people walked up to their, walked up to their table to be prayed for. And then that's not even the best part. The best part, she said, that 10 of those people prayed that same prayer that we pray every single Sunday to be born again. (laughs) Venus did that in a connect group. Venus did that in connect group. The temple courts are great and people are gonna come in here on Sundays and Tuesdays, but we can do that in the house to house. Venus didn't invite people to her house for her connect group. She actually went out in the community and did an outreach connect group. And she sent me an email and this is what she said. I asked them to put this on the screen. I think this is so good. Venus said, I'm praying it would start something like a chain reaction among our congregation and people around the world. She said, we're not preachers, pastors, or elders. We're God's servants with a heart for people in challenged areas. Come on, how many of you know that's multiplication? That's multiplication. Because if we wait for people to walk through these doors each and every single week on Sundays and Tuesdays, that's just addition. Eventually, we're gonna, this is a beautiful building, but there's only so many seats. Eventually, we're gonna run out of room. If there's a thousand people maybe watching this, if every single person did like Jesus did, gather some people around you, if everybody, if ever, so right now, if we're reaching a thousand people, if everybody just invited two people, maybe it's from your job, maybe it's people in your apartment building, maybe it's your person who fixes your coffee each day at the coffee shop, the grow, whatever, pick two people and you got, now we just reached 3,000 and then you can keep doing the math. I'm gonna let you do that on your own. I'm not gonna do it, but whether that's multiplication, we can keep reaching more and more people because you guys, we don't, we don't have, you don't have to wait for us to start the ministry. If you have a burden, maybe I talked to someone the other day, they said, Sally, I have a burden for Venezuela. I said, you should start a connect group of people and pray for Venezuela. And once you get a group of people, you guys should go on a mission trip to Venezuela. That's multiplication. That's how we're gonna reach a billion people. That's how we're gonna reach a billion people. So why do we talk about connect groups so much here? Number one, they're biblical. Number two, they're a cure for loneliness. Number three, they're multipliers. And number four, connect groups are protection. Connect groups are protection. I heard a story a few years ago. I was at a conference and this pastor was speaking and he told this story and I will never forget this story. He said he was speaking in another country and he gave a message. He said there was thousands of people there. He, he gave the message and at the end they did an altar call. People came forward and he talked to this one man. This one man, he remembered him. The man told him his story, incredible story. Man was born again, great story. So the pastor, when the conference was done, He went back to his hotel and he started gathering all his bags. He's gonna get in a taxi and go to the airport to go home. And as he's about to get in the taxi, he looks out and it's the man from the conference. He sees him and the man is like calling him over, like, pastor, come over here, pastor, come over here. And the pastor's kind of like, oh, I need to go. I know I need to talk to him, but if I do that, the taxi's gonna leave me. I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna have to call another taxi. Oh, but I need to go talk to that man. So the pastor says, all right, I'm gonna go talk to the man. So he tells the taxi guy, you can go. He said, I'm gonna get another taxi. Don't even worry about it. He said, I'm gonna be obedient. I'm gonna be spirit led. I'm gonna go talk to the man. So he goes and he talks to the man and the man said, pastor, that taxi that you were about to get into is really a criminal. That's not a real taxi. That taxi, if you get in that taxi, they would actually take you out to the countryside, rob you, beat you, and leave you out for dead. And that pastor said, wow. He goes, wow, thank you. Thank you for saving, thank you for saving my life. 
How many of you know that that pastor needed another set of eyes protecting him? That pastor needed another set of eyes protecting him. And you and I are the same way. We need another set of eyes protecting us. We need another set of eyes that is looking out for us. We can get that in a connect group. And it's not just another set of eyes that, that's looking out for danger and harm all around us. Pastor Tim reminded us on Sunday that the beast is always at the door. The beast is always at the door. The enemy is always lurking. The enemy is always looking to get into your marriage. The enemy is always looking to get into your job, your relationship, your friendships. That's why you need these relationships. That's why you need this community to have be another set of eyes. When maybe you're going off track, I am so thankful. I am so thankful for people in my life who can, who can see past my blind spots. We all have blind spots. We all have blind spots and we need people in our lives to see that and to protect us of that. You guys ever watch the Discovery Channel? And when the gazelles are all gone, do you notice that the lion never attacks the gazelles when they're in a pack? The lion attacks the gazelle when he's off by himself. So we want you, Times Square Church, if you're watching online, if you're here tonight, we want you in a connect group. We want you protected. You need to be protected. Pastor Tim said this a few weeks ago, telling us about Elijah. He said, an obedient man is a protected man. An obedient man is a protected man. How do you get protected? You get people around you. You get a community around you because life change happens when there's life exchange. We can't grow on our own. We can't be everything that God wants us to be by ourselves. I told you about my friend Ingrid that was in our connect group. I didn't tell you the rest of the story. You see, Ingrid, I'm so thankful Lacey and the rest of our group was able to go to all those doctor's appointments with her. And it was awesome. Ingrid got everything she needed. But about a year later, we found out the cancer came back. And tragically, Ingrid passed away. And Ingrid's family lived in another country. They'd never been to America. They didn't speak a word of English. They had no idea what to do. But our connect group was able to help them in the most tragic time in their life. Our connect group protected them. There was insurance people, there were doctors that were trying to get money out of them, just, just all kinds of evil things. And our connect group was protection. Ingrid, Ingrid, Ingrid is in glory. She's with Jesus now. But our connect group still protected her here on earth. Our connect group, I remember the day we went to her house. We got a bunch of people. We cleaned out her house. We put it on the market. We sold it. We, we dealt with the insurance agents. We made sure that Ingrid and her family weren't suffering this for years. That's what community could do. And you can't, you can't build community in crisis. Ingrid didn't wait till that crisis to build her community. Jesus didn't wait until that crisis to build community. We can't be everything that God wants us to be by ourselves. We need other people. We need God. We need other people. We need these kind of relationships. But most importantly, we need this relationship with God, right? I heard a story um, I read a story actually a few weeks ago and it was about this hiker in Colorado and she definitely needed a lot of help. She definitely needed some people around her. She should have built a community before that. And I've never been hiking in Colorado, but I have some friends who go there often and I asked them, I said, what is it, you know, what's it like? And they explained it, just the vastness of it, how big it is and how it's so easy to get disoriented. And that's exactly what happened to this hiker. She, was hyping, she, was, she went on a hike in an area called Mount Elmore and it's actually the second highest peak in the Rocky Mountains. And she leaves for the hike in the morning and it's, it's over 14,000 feet. It's, it's kind of a crazy hike. And this hiker said, I, I'm gonna, she told her family, I'm gonna go out on a hike. Um, it, the, the hike, they say, is supposed to take about seven hours. Well, she left at eight in the morning and that night by 11 p.m., she still hadn't gotten home. So her family called the local authorities. They called the police and filed a missing persons report and said, hey, you know, she went on this hike. We, we can't find her. And so the Lake County, that's the name of the county, the Lake County search and rescue team, they like put all, you know, everybody, let's go find this hiker. They sent rescuers. They sent everyone. They searched all night. They searched all night. They couldn't find her. And so about three in the morning, the team said, hey guys, let's shut it down. And then tomorrow morning, we'll pick back up. We'll pick back up. We'll start searching for her again. 
Well, the next morning they pick up and they get a call about 8 a.m. And they say, hey, we found her. They found her. She she had found her way back to her car. And they they asked her, like, what happened? And she said, I don't know. I just got disoriented, the, the, the altitude, whatever. I just got lost. And so she said, what I ended up doing, she goes, I just spent the night on the mountains by myself. I didn't know what to do. I had no idea where I was. It was dark. I couldn't find my way. I was lost. I didn't know what to do. And so the Lake County Search and Rescue team, they go, well, we're so thankful that you're okay. And they said, we have one question. They said, we kept calling you all night and you never answered your phone. They said, we texted you, we called you, you never answered. And the hiker responded, well, I didn't know the number, so I didn't answer the phone. (laughs) How many of you know if you're lost in the Rocky Mountains and you get a phone call, you probably should answer that, right? And maybe you're here tonight, maybe you're watching online and you're like that hiker and you're lost. And maybe you feel like there's a separation maybe between you and God. Maybe you feel like you can't have these relationships. You can't. If you don't have this relationship right with God, doesn't matter how many connect groups you start, doesn't matter how many connect groups you join, it will never be right because we are lost just like that hiker without God. And I'm here tonight to remind you and to tell you that God is calling your cell phone. Don't miss your opportunity to answer that call. Don't miss your opportunity to answer that call. Tonight, we didn't even really, we didn't talk about sin. We didn't talk about all these, but some of you, you're still feeling something right now. That's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's a good thing. You're going, something's not right. You're feeling lost like that hiker. Maybe maybe a seven hour trip like she did that ended up taking 24 hours. Maybe there's some things in your life that you feel like, man, I'm trying. I'm trying with my children. I'm trying with my marriage. I just can't get it right. I feel lost. I feel separated from God. I need help. You are lost. Without God, we can't do this. You are separated with, you are separated from God. That's called sin. God had to send his son Jesus to to bring that relationship close together. And so maybe you're here tonight and you're going, Sally, I want to answer that call. I want to answer that call. You're watching this mom, dad, grandmother. Maybe you're a businessman. You're on a train. You're going to Japan and God is calling you home. He's calling you home. The Bible says that the son of man came to seek and to save. Just like that Lake County rescue team. They went, save that hiker, your heavenly father, your rescuer. It came and he's coming after you and he's waiting for you to answer that call. Maybe you've been coming to church and you don't, you, you just, you can't feel, you're not feeling, I don't understand, I don't get it. It's because you, maybe you're, you don't have that relationship with God. That relationship with God, that's called being born again. That's called being born again. And man, I want you to have these relationships. I want you to be in the connect groups. I want you to get in next steps. I want you to do all of those things. But before you can do any of that, you got to get this one right. You got to get this relationship right. So if you're here tonight, maybe you're watching online, I want to give you an opportunity to answer that call. Just like that hiker, she missed her chance to answer the call. I want you to answer the call. And you say, well, Sally, how do you do that? It's very, very simple. Jesus gave us these words in John 3, 3. He said, no man or woman can, can see the kingdom of heaven without being born again. And see, when you're born again, that means that not only is your eternity with Jesus in heaven forever, but your, but your life here on earth, you have a relationship with him now. Your life here on earth is going to get better too. Not only will you forever get better, but your life here on earth will get better. Your relationships with your, with your partner, your spouse, your, your children, your coworkers, those are going to get better too because you're right with God. He's the creator. He built the relationships. He built the relationship. So if you, it, t- tonight I want to give you a chance to be born again. And you say, well, how do I do that? How do I, how do I, how do I see the kingdom of heaven? How am I born again? It's really, really simple. We say it all the time. It's as simple as ABC. We all, we all were born once in a hospital. We were born physically, most of us in a hospital, but you have to be born again spiritually. So how do you do that? It's as simple as ABC. A just means admitting you're a sinner. We're all born with a sin condition. 
Every single one of us. Not a priest, a pastor, a program can fix it. Our connect groups can't fix it. Next steps, two, one, two. None of that can fix it. Only God himself. Only God himself can fix your and yours and my sin condition. We say, how do you do that? Well, that's the B word. That's believing that God sent his son Jesus to die in your place. Maybe you feel separated from God. It's because you are. That's because God had to send Jesus to get in your place to fill that gap. It doesn't matter how many connect groups you start. You cannot, you cannot do that on your own. You have to believe that God sent his son Jesus to fix that sin condition himself. And then the last word, C, C just simply stands for confess. That's confessing him as Lord and Savior. That's saying, God, you're the boss of my life. Not just Tuesdays and Sundays when we come in here with this large group gathering, but God, you're the boss of my life every day. You're the boss of my life every day. So right now, I want everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. Nobody's gonna be looking but me. Nobody's looking but me. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna ask you to stand up. I'm not gonna ask you to come forward. I'm just gonna simply, in a few moments, I'm gonna ask you just simply to raise your hand if you wanna be born again. If you're like that hiker and you're lost, you feel like you're spending the night on the mountain. You can't get it right. It just seems like everything's taking so long. You're not sure what the problem is. It's because you gotta get right with God. You gotta be born again. So if you're here tonight and you're ready to answer that call from God, you're ready to be born again, Right now, with nobody looking but me, would you just simply lift up your hand? Would you just simply lift up your hand? Nobody's looking but me. Thank you. I see you. One, two, three, four. Thank you. Five. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Seven. Eight. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. You can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. Thank you, God, for those eight people. Come on, can we pray this prayer together? Just repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I would not have to go. You, you rose from the dead, to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and say this really loud, a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is now my home. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Come on, put your hands together for those eight people.